Nigerian Civil War in 2003. Uh, the book describes uh, the events of the Civil War that he experienced uh, as a child. Um, since then, uh, the public, since its publication, it's received global interest and is utilized in U.S. universities, uh, various U.S. universities, as a uh, um, the talking point uh, highlighting genocide and ethnic cleansing. Um, Alfred has since then uh, published a second book, Nigeria Contemporary uh, Commentaries and Essays, which serves as a critical commentary of Nigeria's uh, trials and tribulations in a way to uh, move forward. Um, when he's not writing, Alfred works as a civil engineer registered in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and D.C. <laughs> so uh, please join me in welcoming Alfred to the Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. That's all we had. That wasn't a welcoming one. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. 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 Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jenna, for the introduction. When I was originally invited here to speak, you know, I uh, said to myself, there's no way that I can say that I wouldn't speak. Why? Because, you know, most of my kids were actually delivered at John Hawkins University. So that's why when I got the original invitation, I thought I was going to the, the hospital. <laughs> so I put my, my GPS to go down there until I talked to Chenna and so on. Um, and I need to say that some of them have since graduated and left home. And uh, I thank you all for the invitation. I'll be speaking about my book, Surviving in Biafra, the story of the Civil War, Nigerian Civil War. I'm sure some of you are wondering how an engineer became a historian of sorts. The truth is that I never set out in the first place to become a historian, if I'm one. Uh, but from 1967 to 1970, I witnessed a devastating civil war. And that was when I was seven years from age seven to age 10. I witnessed a devastating civil war in which about two million people died. When the war ended, rather than discuss all the things that brought about the war so that we will, you know, take, you know, record things and find out exactly what triggered that war and take care of it, most people avoided the subject. It was like it was a taboo to even talk about the war. The few books written about the war were written by military men, people who fought the war. What did they do? They simply wrote the book from the perspective, from their perspective, you know, things that will glorify them, make them look like heroes, which wasn't exactly what I wanted. And they largely ignored what children of my age suffered, like starvation, air raids, neglect, heartbreak occasioned by separation of families from one another, and death. In that war, thousands of children died, their parents. And I knew and played with some of them because before they met their untimely deaths. To immortalize the children of Biafra that died senselessly, I wrote a three-part essay about my experience. And it was published on NigeriaWorld.com, an internet news magazine. I was surprised by how well the story was received by the readers. In fact, at the origin of the readers, I hunkered down and wrote the full story. That's why you have the book, Surviving in Biafra. But then when the book was published, some Nigerians said, hey, Alfred, you may just be opening old wounds. I responded that those who shy away from history are bound to repeat its ugly parts. You must remember your history. Even as you, you know, come together to make peace, you must remember your history. So tonight, I will speak to you about my book under six broad headings. How the war started, massacre in Asaba, air raids on children and civilians, starvation of children and civilians, child soldiering and a mother's agony. But before I start, I know some of you may, may have some roots, like I spoke to somebody there, to Nigeria, and so you probably understand or know parts of Nigeria, but I will indulge you anyway by, by talking about some general facts. The map on this, that will come on the screen will give you some broad information. Nigeria is in West Africa and bounded to the north by a country called Niger. To the east, we have Cameroon. To the west, there is the Benin Republic. And to the south, 
to have the Atlantic Ocean. It's there. It has a current population of about 190 million people. And the country has many ethnic groups that speak more than 250 dialects. Think about that. But the central medium of communication in Nigeria is English because Nigeria, of course, was uh, uh, colonized by the British. There are three major ethnic groups in the country, the houses, who primarily inhabit the northern part of Nigeria. The Yorubas inhabit the southwestern part of Nigeria, and the Igbos inhabit the southeast. Prior to 1914, all the ethnic groups in Nigeria were leading their separate lives with different religions and cultural dispositions. To make governance easier, the colonial masters actually brought the different ethnic groups together into a single unit called Nigeria. That was how Nigeria was born. And that process was called amalgamation of Nigeria, bringing together of dis disparate units. Amalgamation of people with different socio-cultural and ideological inclinations caused interethnic squabbles and religious conflicts in the nation. The people of the northern region, the houses, were mainly Muslims, while those of the southern region were mainly Christians. Forced to live together in one nation through the amalgamation, they temporarily coexisted, but a cold war continued to brew by way of ethnic and religious tensions. Struggle for independence gave a common cause to the various ethnic groups and forced them to temporarily set aside their differences while they fought for independence. Once Nigeria gained independence from Britain in 1960, interethnic suspicion and religious differences resurfaced again. All this culminated in a series of uprisings with the ethnic groups pitted against one another. In 1966, there was a large-scale pogrom or massacre of thousands of Easterners by their northern Nigerian counterparts in the north. The pogroms were supposed to be a form of retaliation against the Igbos. The houses believed that the 1966 coup in which northern leaders were killed was mas masterminded by Igbo military officers. Indeed, there was a coup, and indeed, that coup had a lot of Igbo officers. So the houses believed that the Igbos masterminded this coup. And then went on the, the, the massacre and pogrom and things like that. So when the pogroms will not stop, in spite of assurances by some of Nigeria's leaders, the Easterners concluded that their safety could no longer be assured in the north. Consequently, they began to move back to their homeland, the eastern portion of Nigeria. Finally, on May 30th of 1967, with the mandate of the Eastern House of Assembly, the governor of Eastern Nigeria, Colonel Emeka Odome Bujuku, declared secession of Eastern region from the nation of, Ni of Nigeria, and the new nation was called Biafra. That's how Biafra was born. I remember then, I was a very little boy, we were running around singing, but we were calling it Biafra until we were you know, brought to understand that the name was Biafra. Refusing to accept the sovereignty of Biafra, the government of Nigeria, led by Colonel uh, Yakub Gowon, declared the secession illegal. They mobilized troops of about 100,000 men, mainly made up of Hausa and Yoruba ethnic groups, to fight people of the eastern region. The map on the screen will show you the location of Biafra. And according to General Gowen, the massive military buildup was to reintegrate Biafra into Nigeria. Refusing to be forced into a nation where their safety was now in question, Biafra took up arms in their defense with about 3,000 troops. So think about that, 100,000 troops and 3,000 troops. A 30-month-old war, or war, civil war began between Nigeria and Biafra. My book is about what I saw, what I experienced during that war as a little boy. My family is from Nnewi in eastern region, or eastern Nigeria. Before the war started, we were living in the capital of Nigeria called Lagos. My father was a social welfare officer at the Yaba College of Technology in Lagos. My mother was a nurse. But as hostilities against the Easterners started, we were forced to leave Lagos and return to my hometown in the Newi. We were in the Newi 
when the war formally started in September of 1967. That was when the very first shots were fired and the war started earnestly. My book captures the aftermath of a gruesome incident that occurred at the outset of, outset of the war in a place called Asaba in October of 1967. Incidentally, Asaba is my mother's hometown. When the war started, Asaba indigents were caught in the middle. They speak Igbo language like all Biafrans and are Igbos by ethnic persuasion. But according to you know, the, the division of Nigeria into states, they were characterized as Midwesterners. So they were caught in the middle. When Nigerian troops entered Asaba en route to the Biafran heartland in October, they surmised that the allegiance of the Asaba people was to their natural ethnic group, the Biafrans. As they began their rampage through Asaba, the indigents assumed that if they showed allegiance to Nigerian troops, they will be spared. So hundreds of Asaba indigents gladly gathered in their village square in their festive attires, chanting, one Nigeria, one Nigeria, with banners and things like that, trying to create the impression of the fact that they had allegiance towards Nigeria. Nigerian soldiers were not impressed. They accosted the indigents in the village square and separated the men from the women. What happened next was unconscionable then and is still unconscionable. They opened fire on the men and young boys. Hundreds lay dead. And the women folk were forced to bury their dead. What you see here is a real picture of my family, my maternal family in Asaba, people who were affected. During the massacre, my maternal grandfather, G.W. Guam, in black suit, sitting third from left, was killed. My uncle, Gibson Guam, standing in the back, second from right, was also killed, a young man that had all his future in front of him. My great uncle, in black suit again, sitting second from right, was killed. Many other relatives were killed. Now, my book captures what happened when news of the gruesome massacre came to my mother in the Nehru. In one fell swoop, she lost her father, her brother, and her uncle. One of the most frightening aspects of the war started slowly, but later became a constant feature over the Africa. Nigerian jets perfected the act of indiscriminately dropping bombs over civilian targets like homes, schools, hospitals, markets, and refugee camps. After each episode, they left immense destruction in their wake. The result was that more civilians, children, and women died in this war than those actually fighting in the war front. Before, before my town, Nnewi, witnessed her very first air raid, we were advised because there was so much rumor during that war. And think about me as a seven-year-old, seven going to eight. You're hearing all kinds of rumors. One of the rumors we heard was that we were advised if you're walking around or playing and you sense that the airplane, Nigerian airplanes were in disguise, you just stand still. Just stand wherever you are. Don't move. You know what the logic is? The logic from that rumor was that the pilots would think we were tree trunks and fly away. <laughs> well, when I flew in a commercial aircraft for the very first time in 1979, nine years after the war ended, as the plane was descending, I could clearly tell the difference between trees and humans. You could all can bear me witness that as the plane is descending, you see everything unless you have a very bad sight. <laughs> it then dawned on me that during the war, Nigerian pilots saw their targets. They saw us clearly as we were standing still. No wonder the aftermath of their missions were always deadly with, with mass civilian casualties where people would be standing around. In Biafra towns like Aba, Oweri, and Portakot, mangled and charred bodies of human remains became constant features after the air raids. Families usually picked up bits and pieces of their loved ones for quick burials. As soon as the war went into full gear, in addition to military siege, 
Another tactic employed by Nigeria to subjugate and subdue Biafra was land and sea blockade. The soldiers blocked every avenue that Biafra had for the importation of food. This severely limited and even prevented the delivery of food into Biafra. Some charities that vowed to continue helping starving children started clandestine food drop operations at night. In spite of their best efforts, food scarcity was worsening. As the world protested the inhumanity of the blockade, Nigeria asserted that starvation was a legitimate instrument of war. So they pressed on with this policy. Common food items became exceedingly scarce. A form of malnutrition disease called Pashioko started. It was affecting most of the Biafra population but was harder on children. For victims of the ailments first, their complexion will start changing. Then their stomach will become bloated. Slowly they will begin to look like skeletons. Eventually, without intervention, they died. The pictures you see on the screen are real. Some people look at it and say, what, well, you know, is this computer animation? No. Between 1967 and 1970, this was what we saw. Some of these folks were, well, I, I, I think I was slightly older than them. But this was the scene, the things we saw. They are starving children. The disease was so prevalent everywhere, homes, refugee camps, and schools, that we resorted to eating everything available just to ward off malnutrition. We locally made contraptions. Children of my age hunted animals that traversed the Biafran landscape, squirrels, rabbits, lizards, and more. The ailment was said to be exacerbated by protein deficiency. So we tried to stem the tide of the disease by eating more protein, regardless of the animal type that it came from. In search of vitamins and minerals, we ate all manners of herbs and leaves, sometimes to our detriment. Stories abound of people dying after inadvertently eating inedible or poisonous leaves or mushrooms. A classmate of mine died, passed away after eating. People were saying, what did he eat? They said he ate a, a, a form of, uh, uh, we call it baits, that he was not supposed to eat, poisonous. He died. In the book, I tell the story of Augustine, my classmate in second grade. He suddenly became sickly and could no longer play with other children during recess. Then his complexion changed while his feet became swollen. One could tell that the malnutrition disease had begun. One day in school, while the rest of us played, he was in one end of the class throwing up and gasping for air. What do we know, kids? We, you know, we are just looking, wondering. The rest of us watched in horror. The next morning, guess what? His chair was empty. It's like you have a classmate that you sit with all the time. Then you can come the next morning. They tell you, you look, the chair is empty. And you say, what's going on? And they tell you he passed away the last, last night. That was life in Biafra. And the same incident was repeating everywhere we looked. When the war originally, originally started, Biafrans were very enthusiastic. They felt that they were defending themselves from injustice meted against them by, the Niger by Nigeria in the 1966 massacre. So men of fighting age, university undergraduates, graduates, artisans, willingly enlisted in the army and went to war. As the war dragged on and casualty numbers began to mount, the situation became intolerable and unbearable. In my village, my village, Newi, no day passed without news of the death of someone that went off to fight the war. As Nigerian offensive continued, Biafra was outnumbered in men and ammunition, and our territory shrunk at an alarming rate. People were becoming demoralized. Soon it became difficult to get as many willing enlistees as before. Left without more choice, Biafra resorted to what we called conscription. Soldiers periodically swooped on homes and took away young men to go and fight. Initially, they conscripted men of fighting age. As that pool began to dwindle, boys of as low as 15 years became very 
families even took turns to nominate young men from their clans to go to war. Hence, a pool of tired soldiers developed. My book captures the story of my brother, Emma, who was only 16 years of age in 1969. My father volunteered him for the war, in spite of the fact that my older brother, Fidelis, was already fighting. Think about this. Here in the United States, you must be 18 years or thereabout to vote, and more than that to be able to buy alcohol. This is because science shows us, or has proven that, at any age younger than that, one must not be mature enough to make and be accountable for any decisions. Yet, in Biafra, circumstances and patriotism forced children of 15 and 16 years to be sent off to war. In my book, I also narrated how soldiers swooped on my family one morning, conscripted my mother's younger brother, Ezengozi, and what followed. Ezengozi was only about 16 years of age. One thing I always wondered, though, is how traumatic the war experience must have been on the Biafran child soldiers who survived and returned. In Africa, then, nobody thought about post-trauma. You know how you say PTSD, post-traumatic? Nobody thought about that. They were expected to just come home from war and resume normal life. So if any one of them acted funny, the people would just think the person is just crazy or whatever. Many of them never talk about the war. They must have internalized their experiences with attendant repercussions. My eldest brother, Fidelis, went to the war at 17 years of age. My parents tried to dissuade him, but he wanted to go and defend Biafra. His thought was that the massacre of Biafrans by Nigeria in the north was unforgivable. My brother went to the training depot, my father went to the training depot where he was training, getting ready to go to war and told him to come home. He turned to my, my father, a man he respected, and said, you know what, you're older now. It's my responsibility to take care of you. You've taken care of me. I'll go to this war. If I die, so be it. My father came back. That, was, that very thing haunted my father so many years after the war, because he was always thinking about that wondering if he could have insisted that Fidelis come home. Many of the men that went to the war periodically returned to see their families. My brother, Fidelis, rarely visited. He spent all his time in the war front. On one occasion, when he returned, he was eating. Like I mentioned, that I was a little boy, always admiring him. When he will come home eating, my <coughs> younger brother and I would sit just on the ground, looking at him at like, somebody we admired so much. Well, as he was eating, he heard a, a loud bang in one of the war sectors. He left his food, bid us goodbye, and hurried away to the sector. It was one of those sectors where, you know, every night, the sound of war machines, guns, and bombs, sometimes even at my age, I would sit in one corner thinking, every bit of this sound I hear probably ends the life of somebody. For me, it was a daily mental agony when the war ended and Fidelis did not return. A brother I loved and looked up to was missing. I would sit around and think of what it would be like if and when he returned. Days turned into weeks, into months, and still, no fidelis. My mother will not give up, though. She went any and everywhere to look for her son. We constantly got one lead or the other as to the whereabouts of my brother, but they amounted to nothing. They were kind of rules. One day, a woman appeared because my mother was running a maternity home in the Newe when she moved from, Newe, from Lagos to Newe. So a woman one day appeared in her maternity room where she was treating other women. She told my mother that some people from the Midwest came to her house the previous day. And during a discussion, they said that one Fidelis Uzoku was seen in a place called Ononu. According to the woman, Fidelis had removed his Biafran uniform after Nigerian troops overran the place. It was a common thing when the Nigerian troops were coming to 
a certain and seize a certain town, some soldiers, of course, will, to, to avoid detection, will take off their, their uniform. But sometimes they won't find you know, a civilian uniform to wear. So according to that woman, she said that Fidelis took off his uniform and had nothing to wear to come back to Nehru. The woman advised my mother to hurry down to Ndono with clothes for my brother. My mother was a little reluctant to pursue this lady. Not too long before then, someone had given her the same type of story. She went around the Nehru searching for my brother to no avail, going through all this emotional yo -yo. This time, though, she felt a little assured because she knows the woman that told her that. Nonetheless, my mother wanted to verify the story with the people. But the woman that gave her this message said that the people had gone back to the Midwest. My mother came home that evening from her maternity and narrated her encounter with this woman with measured optimism. But she concluded that she was going to go to Onono to look for Fidelis. And so she asked my father to provide some clothes for her to go with. Very early the next morning, we prayed for a successful journey and wished her well. She set out for Onicha, en route to Onono. The journey to Onicha in a rickety vehicle was not very pleasant. Being her first time of venturing outside the Newe after the war, she saw the devastation that the war left behind for the first time. The roadside was littered with charred vehicles and abandoned war machines. Trees were brown from the effects of guns and bombs. Human skulls and remains were all over the landscape, reminding her of her relatives that perished in the war. She cried intermittently, but continued to hope that the return of her son will give her some reprieve and comfort. In Onicha, my mother got off and trekked to the Niger River bank, en route to Anuna. A few fishing canoes were drifting aimlessly on the river. She beckoned to a fisherman in one of the boats and asked to be taken to Onuna. The man was puzzled and asked what she was going to Onuna to do. When she told him, the man shot her and stated rather categorically that there were no different soldiers. All the Biafran soldiers captured in Onono by Nigerian soldiers were sent to Onicha prison, the man said. He advised my mother to check Onicha prison first before embarking on a journey that might turn out to be dangerous and fruitless. Disappointed, my mother walked back into Onicha with the afternoon sun beating down mercilessly on her. She could feel her energy level dwindling slowly. Her stomach was churning badly because out of excitement that morning, she did not eat before leaving. With directions from the locals, she arrived at the prison, sweating profusely. A stern-looking Nigerian army officer was standing outside the prison. He demanded to know what my mother was there for. She greeted him nicely and told him what her mission was. The soldier beckoned after some back and forth on a subordinate and instructed him to take my mother around the prison camp in search of Fidelis. Patiently, the soldier took my mother from prison camp to prison camp. In each camp, they would stop and ask if Fidelis was always in the camp. After going through the last camp, the soldier turned to my mother and sympathetically said, well, woman, this is the last camp, and you can see that your son is not there. Even though my mother had been told that there were no different soldiers in Onono, she was bent on going there to see things for herself. Quietly sobbing now, she thanked the soldier and slowly made her way back to the river bank. There, another fisherman agreed to ferry her over to Onono for a fee, but warned again that she may not find anybody there. There were anxious moments when the boat came close to capsizing. My mother prayed all the way because it would be a taboo in African sense, she felt, for people to tell the story of a mother who drowned in search of her son. In Onono, she was dropped off in a swampy, deserted area with trees all over. She could see pathways, but there were no houses inside. The pathway was littered with burnt out iron beds, boxes, and skeletal remains of units. As the fisherman's boat started receding into the distance, she silently prayed.
before starting out on the pathway. There were very little signs of habitation in the area but she could see destruction of lives and property all over. This did not daunt her. She walked on. After a while, the pathway widened and in the distance she saw a small dilapidated building in the middle. As she got closer to the house, two men in Nigerian military uniform emerged from the building and fixed their gaze on her. Her heart started racing. She was wondering how they would react to her. As the house, at the house, she greeted the soldiers but was too frightened to tell them what she came for because according to her, the looks in their eyes were terrifying. Instead, she said she was looking for her mother who was left in Onuna at the outset of the war. One of the soldiers told her that her mother was not there but directed her to be shot about a mile away. He said that there were a, was a family out there that she could ask. He thanked them and headed for the shack. At this time, judging from what my mother had seen, or had seen, hope that she would find Fidelis in order began to deal. She could tell that fierce fighting may have taken place there, but Fide, as we fondly called it, could not possibly be in such a deserted place. At the shack, a man was sitting in front, facing a body of water and mending a fisherman's net. But just as she started speaking to the fisherman, a pregnant woman and a young boy came out of the shack. She greeted them nicely and narrated her ordeal. Although sympathetic, the man did not mince words in telling her that all captured Biafran soldiers were sent to Onitra prison, the same Onitra prison she went to. So essentially, there was no other hope for my mom to hope. A mother's hope was crushed. There was no other hope for her, to, so she actually broke down there and started crying. Of course, the fisherman's family did the much they could to console a mother in agony. When she regained her composure, it was time to go because the sun had started setting. All the time she was making her way to Honore, she did not succumb to fear. Even when she passed by the destruction littered all over the landscape, However, with the last hope having vanished in thin air, she could no longer manage her fear. She felt like she could no longer walk by the pathway to get back to the riverbank. She thought about the skeletal remains all over the landscape and wondered what may have happened to Fidelis. The thought was simply too much for her to bear. She stated her fear to the fisherman who asked the little boy to escort her to the riverbank, and he did. At the riverbank, my mother thanked the boy, and as he left, she 